Welcome to Emmanuel. It's great to see all of you here on this beautiful summer morning. We are continuing our study of the path, the principle of the path today, remembering that it is not your intentions, but rather your direction that determines your destination. So we're going to talk a little bit more uh, today about why it's so difficult for us to tell the truth. So... I look forward to that, you know, you know <laughs> in a few minutes, <laughs> see if we can have a remedy to that. A few things before we begin, as always, if you would fill out your connection card, we appreciate that so we can stay connected, and especially over the summer, uh, we are going to make a concerted effort to connect with, with every single one of you, uh, in one way or another, either in person, by phone call, email. Uh, text, carrier pigeon, drone, whatever it might be, so that we can stay connected as we again gear up for the fall and ministry uh, and serving uh, the Lord through our church and in our community. So we look forward to that. And there on uh, the screen and, of course, in your bulletin, you have the QR code. Or you can fill out the connection card. That is always great as well. The same for giving. We appreciate your generosity. Uh, you are a very generous congregation, and it is your generosity that allows us to share the gospel with each other and with our community as well as the world. So you can use the QR code as well, or you can use your envelopes or the basket, which is in the back at the end of the service. So I, I want to give a, a quick shout out. I don't know if Bob Dorn is here this morning, but uh, this <clears throat> a previous weekend, not last Saturday, but the one before, our Vets for Veterans event was highly success successful. Uh, we did indeed pack the pod with lots of things for veterans who are exiting homelessness. And we also had a great, I thought, uh, day honoring our veterans uh, through all the, the activities and events that were here. So let's thank all of those that were involved, and especially Bob, for his good work, if you would. <laughs> Also, uh, today, you will find a flyer on your way out. This next week, beginning tomorrow, is Vacation Bible School. And one of the things that we always do here at Emmanuel is contribute to the Crystal Lake Food Pantry. So this flyer has directions on what to bring. And you can then fill that up with the grocery bag or in a grocery bag at home. Bring it uh, this week during Vacation Bible School. We're going to collect it all next Sunday, so you can still bring it Sunday, and then take it uh, to the food pantry. So we thank you in advance for that. Uh, today is Father's Day, and so let's give a shout out to all the dads out there. Welcome them. <laughs> thank you for all you do. Your godly example is important to our families, to our church and community. We do have a gift for you. There is a really snazzy, and I didn't wear mine indoors because my grandmother Kramer always said, don't wear a hat inside, so I can't do that. I will wear it, though, for the, for the next service, but you can wear yours anytime. It says Emmanuel Crystal Lake on it, and we also have real donuts today. <laughs> ah, yeah. All right, so it doesn't get any better than that, so. And I think that is it. Uh, one last announcement, next week's Vacation Bible School service will be at 11. So that means that next week at 8 o'clock will be our regular service uh, with the Lord's Supper. And 9.30 will be outside as it usually is. And then at 11 we'll have a special a Vacation Bible School service. I think that's it. So let's all rise. We'll sing our first hymn.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Like those in Jeremiah's day, we are a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good nor faithful, following our own devices and desires. We, on our own, have no right to be called your heirs or to receive your blessings. Like those who ignored the truth when Jesus stood before them, we too often prefer Jesus to part from us rather than offer our praise for his power and glory and truth. Our guilt, shame, and fear overtake us, and we refuse your blessings of grace, forgiveness, and new life. For the many times we ignore or shatter your law and choose to forget, who you have called us to be as your own children. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Through the mercy and sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, and in spite of our sinful nature and willful breaking of his law given out of love, he calls us his children and his heirs. Through Christ alone, we have gained access to his grace by which we now stand. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The Spirit now testifies that you are God's children. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ that we may share in his glory. Thanks be to God. Go ahead and be seated. It's time now to hear from the word of God. Our reader today is Nick Gottschalk. The Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 through 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel if you are able. The Gospel of John from chapter 8, verses 31 through 41. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are, Abraham, <clears throat> excuse me, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you. Nick. 
It's time now for our children's message, so children, come on down. Miss Nikki is here today to share a message with you. Here she is. Hi, good morning, everybody. It's great to see your faces today. All right. Let's see. I recognize a few of you guys from one I did. The last time I did this, I did Mother's Day. And I was <laughs> sitting at my table making some treats and stuff, and I was like, gosh, I wish God would send me a sign. Do you want to sit by me? Awesome. Nice to meet you. I wish God would send me a sign. <laughs> I want to do an awesome message like I did for Mother's Day because fathers are so important to us. And I was sitting there, and I was thinking, and I was thinking, and then I saw it, the thing that gave me an idea. This. Bam! <laughs> Go. <laughs> what is it? Right? You get it? Everybody gets it? No. OK. Well, OK. OK. We're going to go. What are some things about gum that are like your dad? <laughs> Aww. You hear that, Mr. Dunderdale? He says you're sweet. <laughs> I made him blush. <laughs> OK, so dads can be sweet. That's a good one. What else? How else can dads be like gun? They're minty. No. no. They have long-lasting flavor. No. <laughs> Ew, no. Uh, they come in a silver wrapper. No. They get stuck to the bottom of your shoe. No. Do you want to know the answer? No. No, you don't want to know the answer. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> what kind of gum is this? What's the name of it? I don't know. You don't know? I don't even know. Mint? So what is it? It's in big letters. It says? Long No. Up here. So this is extra. The name brand is extra. And when I saw the word extra, I went, oh, that's it. See, if we go back to like what I was saying during Mother's Day, OK? God made the heavens. He made the earth. He made the land. He made the water. He made the flora. He made the fauna. He made all of these things. And he looked at how beautiful it was, and something was missing. He wanted to make something extra. He needed more, right? So God made? Extra, he made man, OK? That's just like your family, moms and dads, right? Moms and dads had each other. You had a house. Some of you probably have dogs or cats or fish. You have a car. You were going on vacations. You got to see extended family. But guess what? Something was missing. You wanted something extra. And that's where you guys come in. You are that something extra. Every beautiful child here, every adult who was a beautiful child at one time, and you are all still beautiful, by the way, you guys were all wanted. You were something extra. How many of you guys have heard me at VBS um, or here at school or even during children's messages? What have I said my favorite name for God is? My favorite name for God is God the Father. Huh? Yeah, because there's different names. We can call him Heavenly Father, God the Father, all-knowing, omnipotent, great force, right? Different religions call him things like Yahweh. But I love God the Father because it gives me this warm feeling, right? God wanted extra. He wanted man. He wanted a child. He wanted more. But the thing is, God the Father isn't God the Father. He's just God without children, right? Is your dad a dad without kids? Yeah. No. See, God the Father isn't a father without kids either. And that's that beautiful back and forth relationship we have with God, right? He takes care of us. We're thankful to him. So it's really a beautiful thing and a beautiful way to always feel close to God and to feel close to your father. So the last thing I always like to tell you guys when I do this is I believe that when you look out into the world, you can find something absolutely anywhere that will remind you of God and how close you are. So last time I was talking about flowers and how when we see flowers, we can remember everything that God created for us. 
This time it's something simple. This time it's bubble gum. Yeah. Okay. This time, next time you go to a baseball game with dad and he gives you a stick of gum, okay? Or maybe if you're in class and somebody passes you a stick of gum that you're not supposed to have, shh, I won't tell, okay? Remember that you are wanted and you are that little something extra, just the way everybody in this church right now was a little something extra that God wanted, okay? Will you guys fold your hands and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for wanting and needing us as much as we want and need you. Thank you for giving us so many beautiful things to help take care of us. And thank you for letting us show you your love by carrying on your name. In your name we praise. And the people said, amen. All right, you guys can go sit down. Thank you. So dads, have you ever told your son or your daughter, you cannot have a cookie before dinner? Have you ever done that? So you can't have a cookie before dinner. Hands off, keep out of the cookie jar. Then the child goes and they take the cookie from the cookie jar and you call them on it and they say something like, but dad, I thought you said I could have one. Or maybe a more recent example, you're driving along and all of a sudden your heart misses a beat because you see these terrifying blue lights in your rear view mirror, right? And you're stopped and you say, but officer, I could swear I wasn't speeding. Today we're going to talk about truth in lying. Why is it that even though we know that the best policy is always to tell the truth, in fact, if you're over 18 years old, your life experiences in, in the area of finances or relationships tells you that telling the truth always is a better idea, and yet we constantly 
lie. We lie as a child because we want to get something like that cookie, even though we've been told not to. We lie to authorities, even though it's obvious. We are caught red-handed in our mistake, and yet we try to lie our way out of it. So we need to ask ourselves this morning this question. Why do we lie so much? And one related to it, why do we lie chiefly to ourselves? The fact is, if you lie to yourself, you're probably lying to other people as well. And if you're lying to other people, you lie to yourself first. So, here's the answer. The fact is, we are not on a truth quest, <laughs> right? You don't wake up this morning and say, you know, I think I am going to uh, seek truth, wisdom, integrity, and enlightenment today. No, we are all on a happiness quest. Our human nature is such that we want to be happy. We want to feel happy. We want to feel good about ourselves, and we do that most of the time by doing things that will make us happy. So here's an example. How many of you out there are coffee drinkers? Any coffee drinkers? Did you have your coffee this morning? Anybody go to Starbucks this morning? Not yet too early for that. Anybody going to go later? Anybody go to Starbucks at all anymore? I, don't, I do not go to Starbucks very often. Every now and then I do. But I understand that there are some out there, none of you, of course, because you are godly people, but you would not spend $4.15 on what is it, a cafe, latte, venti, something, something, right? Why would you spend $4 on a cup of coffee when... I can go right in there, and I have my Folgers in there, and I can make 200 cups of coffee for four bucks. <laughs> well, some people will do that because it makes them happy. It makes them feel good. In some cases, it makes their coworkers feel good, too, because they're really grouchy when they don't have their Starbucks, right? So that is what they do. Well, let me pick on somebody else this morning, because <laughs> that's what I do, right? <laughs> so... How many of you have clothes in your closet that you haven't worn in the last year? Anybody? <laughs> Me too. Why do we do that? Why do we continue to buy new clothes even though we have a closet full of stuff that is perfectly good? In fact, some of you today will be going shopping and you're going to buy new clothes. Maybe you're just browsing on the internet because that's what you do, and you find something, and it catches your eye, and you think, oh, i got to have that. Why do we do that? Because if it's new and stylish, we feel better about ourselves. We want to be happy. Well, here's another one. How many of you have a cell phone? Raise your hand. Just about everybody. Do you try and get out of your current contract before the old one expires? Do you spend all kinds of time and energy trying to finagle your way into getting a new phone even before the old one in that contract has expired, even though that cell phone that you're using works perfectly fine? I know some of you, you even accidentally drop those things so you can get a new one. Right? Some of you even have two contracts at the same time because you can't wait to get the new one. And we won't even talk about cars and trucks and houses. Why do we have things that we know in the long run are not going to make us happy? Because we have this problem in our minds of not being able to distinguish today from tomorrow. Now, I want to make a point here. It's right here in your notes. God is not against your happiness. <laughs> God is not there up in the heavens wanting to make you miserable. In fact, God likes you to be happy. It's part of the abundant life that we frequently talk about. So, being on a happiness quest is not necessarily wrong. Here's the caveat. Unless happiness points in one direction, and wisdom, and integrity, 
and truth are pointing in another. So God wants us to be happy, but above all, he wants us to seek wisdom, truth, and integrity. Now again, here's the problem. We can be happy today about something, and we can be unhappy about the very same thing tomorrow. So I've got some friends from high school who have been smoking for 40 years. Now, why did they start smoking in the first place? They thought it would be fun. They thought it would be exciting. Some of them wanted to rebel against the authority. But it made them happy, so they started smoking. Later on in life, they kept smoking because it made them feel good, because it helped them keep the weight off. And so they continued to smoke. Do you think any of those people who are smoking now that have been smoking for 40 years are happy that they're still smoking? No, they're not. When they, when they got to that fork in the road, they wished that they had not started smoking, and yet they did. So happy today may not mean happy tomorrow. So again, why do we knowingly choose paths that take us where we've already decided that de we don't want to go? Last week, I talked a little bit about uh, relationships and the choices that we make. These days, in, in marriage counseling, I talk to people about the choices that they are going to make for the rest of their lives. And I counsel them to make sure that they have made the right decision. So often, when someone has a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they just decide, well, this person makes me happy, so I'm going to stay with them. Even though their mother or their father or their good friends or someone else has told them that they are not godly people. And they are going to lead them down the wrong path. And the person knows that it's a bad choice. And yet they stay with that person. They may even move in with that person because they want to be happy now and they don't think about being happy later. There is something that psychologists call confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is something that empowers us to see what we want to see and ignore everything else, even if it is true. So confirmation bias helps to explain why a mother and a daughter can look at a boy and see him completely differently. <laughs> it can explain why the daughter is in love with this young man and the mother sees all of his faults because they're only looking at it through their particular lens. It's why Christians can talk about creation. They can look at nature and see that there is a, a God, a divine presence, who has made all of this, that there has to be some kind of a plan in order for the world to develop how it has. On the other hand, there can be those who are atheists who say, absolutely not, there is no God at all, evolved over millions and millions of years. Confirmation bias. Now, I thought about this for a long time, should we go to politics? No. Why? Because of confirmation bias, right? No matter what I would say, even if it were true, because of your bias, you would be either here or here, most likely. And regardless of who you believe is the best candidate, whatever I say is going to trigger an agreement or a disagreement. We have all of these biases in our life. Even if something is pointed out to us as true and wise and prudent. So as we take a look at our Old Testament reading for today, we get a better idea of why this is so. Now, of course, we need a little bit of background, so let me give it to you. The year is 587 B.C. 
Jotham 587 B.C. King Zedekiah, he is the king of Judah, the people of God in the southern part of the kingdom that we know as Israel. Zedekiah has been warned by the prophet Jeremiah repeatedly that he should turn away from the worship of false gods, put away the idols, turn back to Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and then God will bless the nation. But if he doesn't turn away, they are going to be destroyed. And on top of that, Jeremiah also tells him that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is going to be the protector of Judah. Now the problem is Nebuchadnezzar charges a very large fee for that protection. And Zedekiah loves nice things, and he wants to have it all for himself. He doesn't want to pay the tribute. So God tells him, don't rebel. The prophet Jeremiah tells him, don't rebel. So, of course, what does Zedekiah do? Anybody? He rebels. Because he has a confirmation bias. He already knows what he wants to do. He also knows what he ought to do. But he does what he wants to do because he does exactly what we do as well. We lie to ourselves. We become the sleaziest, slimiest, slickest salesman that we have ever seen and ever heard in order to get our way. And so Zedekiah rebels. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar rushes in, crushes the rebellion, lays siege to Jerusalem, starves its inhabitants, and now Zedekiah comes back to Jeremiah and he cries, can't you do anything? Can't you convince God to change his mind? And Jeremiah says, sorry, too late. Well, there is one thing you could do. You could open the gates, let the army in, give up, and you will save your people. Sounds prudent. If you're the king, save your people. But no, Zedekiah only cares about himself, and he knows that if he surrenders, he will be captured along with his family, and they will be slaves in Babylon. And so he tries to sneak away in the middle of the night. But of course he's caught, and he has to watch as all of his children are slaughtered by the Babylonians. And then they put his eyes out, they wrap him in golden chains, and take him away to Babylon. Now, you just heard that story. What would you have done? We say, really? We would have been different. We would have cared about other people. We would have cared about our family. We would have cared about the kingdom. We would have obviously listened to Jeremiah and to God. But Jeremiah tells us differently. He says these words, the heart is deceitful above all things. Can you repeat that with me all together? The heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart, my heart, every heart. Now there's a difference between deceit and dishonesty. Dishonesty is well, pretty easy to recognize. It's the opposite of being honest. And so when people are dishonest, we say, oh, they just told a lie. And it would be easy if our own heart would just be dishonest, but it's deceitful. It has an agenda. It tries to trick us. And because of that, it is extremely dangerous. Now, you would also think that the older that we get, the more mature that we get, the wiser, supposedly, that we get, the less deceitful we would be. But it's not true. We don't outgrow it. We don't outmature it. And Jeremiah says not only that, there is no Q. 
fewer. But there is hope. Though we can't fix it, though we can't cure it, God has a remedy. We went through it again earlier in our service. We call it confession. So the very first thing is simply to admit that our heart is deceitful, to admit that it cannot be trusted. Do you ever wonder why we do confession every single week? You would think, you know, I confessed last week. God forgave me. I should be better. I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that thing that I keep doing all the time. And yet, here we are, week after week after week after week after week. Let's just admit, our hearts, our mind, our brain, our desires are not always the best. They're not the best for us. They're not the best for others. Nor are they pleasing to God. So we admit it, and then we ask it. By that I mean ask this question. Am I being honest with myself? And then put on this little word, really? (laughs) Am I being honest with myself? Really? Ask yourself then why you do what you do. That's the third thing, be curious. Why do I do what I do? The reason that I eat so much when I know I shouldn't is what? The reason that I don't talk to my kids the way that I should is what? The reason that I rack up so much credit card debt is what, really? The reason that I want to leave my husband or wife is what, really? The reason that I no longer go to church is what, really? It's terrifying, isn't it? To admit to ourselves and to God the real reasons why we do what we do. But you'll find that as you become more honest with yourself, you also become more honest with other people. And even though telling the truth can be terrifying, it is also incredibly liberating. You know the feeling that you get during the confession? When I ask you to make your silent confession to the Lord, nobody else hears it. That great feeling that you get, the burden that is lifted off your heart and your mind when you confess to the Lord. Freedom is the result of confession. Freedom from your lies, freedom from your deceit, freedom from bondage to sin. And that's the freedom that God promises in the abundant life here on earth, in the eternal life that he promises to you that is yours forever in heaven. It's my prayer for each one of you That as you know the truth in Jesus Christ, that you will tell the truth to God, to others, and to yourself so that you might be set free. That you would have the courage and the clarity to know exactly why you do what you do. So that as you repent from this direction, from your bad intentions, Change and follow Jesus once again to the cross. May he grant it to you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Today we have the privilege.
to confirm one of our young men in the congregation, uh, Andrew Simmons. Andrew, if you would please come forward. You can stand right there. There were 21 confirmands of this year in our class. Uh, Andrew was not able to be here uh, on that Sunday, so we are glad that he is here today. So I will address him as I did all the rest of the confirmands that day, and he will give answer. Andrew, do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism? Then answer, yes, I do. Do you renounce the devil? Then answer, yes, I renounce him. Oh, it's on the screen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> we can all answer together. <laughs> Do you renounce all his ways? Then say, yes, I renounce them. Everybody, oh, see, this is where I get confused, right? We're going to say the uh, Apostles' Creed all together. Is that on the screen as well? Okay, we're going to do it just all together. It'll be confusing this way. So all together, let's say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God? Then say, I do. I do. do you confess the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church drawn from the scriptures as you have learned to know it from the small catechism to be faithful and true? Then say, I do. I do. do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Then say, I do by the grace of God. Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word and deed, to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? Then say, I do, by the grace of God. I do, by the grace of God. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? Then say, I do, by the grace of God. And so we rejoice, Andrew, that you have been baptized, that you have received the teaching of the Lord, you have confessed the faith and been absolved of your sins. We pray now that you would continue to hear the Lord's word and receive his blessed sacrament. He who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to invite your parents now to come on up. And sponsors or other family members, you can come on up as well. Sure, you can all come on up. <laughs> That's good. Come up just a little bit more. I'm going to put my right hand on your head, which is the tradition of blessing from the Old Testament. Mom and Dad, you can put your hand on his shoulder. Andrew, the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. I have a couple of gifts for you. As well as your confirmation certificate. Let's turn around and let's give him a round of applause. All right. You may go ahead and be seated. 
Let's all rise now for prayer. At the conclusion of each petition, I will end, Lord, in your mercy, your response, hear our prayer. God the Father Almighty, you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son to save us from our sin and to make us your children and heirs of all your blessings through faith in him. Lord, in your mercy, as you have destroyed the lasting penalties of our sin, eternal death, and the power of the devil, help us to live each day knowing the victory has been won by and through Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, today we pray for our families on this celebratory weekend. We pray for fathers that they faithfully lead their families and children in the way of Christ and peace. Lord, in your mercy. We also pray for mothers, that they have strength and grace to manage their many responsibilities and to give them joy and fulfillment in their work and duties. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray for children, that they grow in the faith in which you have called them through baptism, heirs of your promises, and develop in all ways pleasing to you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, lift up all those who are weighed down by the guilt and shame of sin and poor decisions. Release them from their bondage and regret, and point them to forgiveness at the feet of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, walk with all those who are grieving in the shadow of death, especially Linda Gray and her family at the loss of her father, Severio Coletti, who died on Saturday. Look with favor upon all who are sick, injured, and recovering, especially Judy Bird, Ray Boyer, Judy Coletti, Amy Morgan, Jane Pace, and Robin Telly. Comfort them with the hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Have mercy on them and heal them according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we also praise you for the gift of long life and celebrate this week the birthday of Thor Lazy, who turns 93. Lord, we are so grateful for the gift of life, for families, for our fathers, our mothers, our children, our siblings, and all of those who continue to point us to you. And so into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We conclude then with our closing hymn.